Hi, my name is uh, Gurmeet Manku. In this video, I am sharing with you my personal reasons for adopting a alcohol-free lifestyle. No alcohol at all. What motivates me? I'll share my personal story with you in a moment. There is a five to six year phase in my life where I was doing social drinking, like once a month or once a quarter, and then I stopped suddenly. And my parents' way of uh, raising me, uh, how I was raised in childhood, played a very important role in that step. I'll share the details with you in a moment. Then I will also share with you my motivation stemming from heart associations, cancer organizations, WHO, US guidelines, Canadian food guide. What do they say about alcohol? Okay. Plus, I am inspired by spiritual guidelines. I'll share those too. So my personal story is that about a five-year phase of my life, which started in mid twenties at Stanford, I was drinking some alcohol, and I'm really grateful to my parents because they brought me up in an alcohol-free environment. There was no alcohol at home. My dad never drank. My mom never touched alcohol. There was no alcohol at home. No alcohol in our relatives' place when we visited them. No alcohol when we went out. It was just missing. No alcohol at all. Okay. So for me, it started in around 2000 or 2001 at Stanford. Okay. At that time, I was pursuing a PhD in computer science at Stanford, and around four or five of us got together. We were all friends. Similar age, similar background. We were all from India. We were all pursuing a PhD or a master's in computer science and electrical engineering. Uh, most were pursuing a PhD, and we all had a similar academic background. So you know the kind of people um, uh, who were uh, really skillful in computer science or electrical engineering, and we all came from IITs. Okay, almost all of us, except except one, I think. So. IIT is Indian Institute of Technology. Uh, we have many of them these days, but way back in the past, when I graduated, there were just five of them. Uh, they were Delhi, Bombay, Kanpur, Madras, and uh, Kharagpur. So the kind of people here were, you know, people like presidents, gold medalists, like they were first in the entire IIT, or somebody uh, who was. At the top of the department, like first in computer science or first in electrical engineering, at one of these IITs, and uh, people whose JEE rank was in in single digits, okay, like in the top ten or something. So JEE is this uh, prestigious exam in India. Uh, in my days, there were like a hundred thousand or hundred twenty thousand applicants, and we had to be in the top hundred uh, or hundred fifty to make it to computer science. Okay, so imagine people like that got together. Mid twenties, and for no good reason, uh, we just said let's do it. So for me, it was an impromptu decision, not something which I deliberated. I just told my friends, okay, I'll join. It was somebody's idea, not mine. I said, okay, I'll join. So that's how I got started, and I never thought too much about it. Okay, so then for the next two three years, uh, it was social drinking with meals, uh, with friends outside home, like once a month or once a quarter, once in three months kind of a. Thing going on, okay. Later on, these alcohol bottles came to my home, okay. So they were at home in my kitchen cabinet somewhere, but it was always with meals, uh, with friends who came over to my place to socialize. Uh, I think the alcohol thing was once a month, once a quarter kind of thing going on. Not not a very frequent thing, even if, even though the bottles were at home. Next comes the dangerous step in my life. Uh, later on, uh, around 2005, 2006, I was stressed, uh, seriously stressed. Uh, you know, in life we go through ups and downs in life. So, uh, vicissitudes of life, as they call it. So, I found myself drinking by myself, stress-induced, and it happened only a few times, three, four times at home. I never got drunk. But it happened, okay. <laughs> so you can see the transition I'm going through, like a slow five-year transition. It is culminating in this step, okay. It's a dangerous step in my view. Luckily, I never got drunk. I never drank so much. I didn't become an alcoholic. Suddenly, on one day, 2006, uh, I decided, okay, I'm going back to my parents' way of life. There was no alcohol in my life. My parents never had it, and I grew up with the impression that alcohol is just horrible. We should never touch alcohol. That's how I was brought up. Uh, with this view of life, and I came back, and so I'm very grateful to my parents that they uh, raised uh, uh, their kids with no alcohol, no smoking, no drugs, nothing like that. Okay. Later on, about an year later, I went for these meditation retreats uh, called Vipassana. They are ten-day silent retreats. Very difficult uh, meditation technique that they teach us. Uh, I feel lucky. I went to these retreats and I made some progress. So I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, 
and then this medical perspective came into my life around 2019 or so many years later i learned oh actually alcohol causes so much damage to our body so i'll cover that also in a moment now for the buddhist meditation retreat that i went for the 10 day vipassana retreats silent retreats they tell us you should at the very least follow <laughs> these five basic principles they are called the five precepts there are things like uh, non killing uh, non stealing no sexual misconduct don't tell lies and stay away from intoxicants okay now in multiple spiritual systems we have equivalent guidelines okay uh, so th- these are the five in in this system but very similar guidelines exist in any system that i have come across there are all these good things in life you're not supposed to do these things right among these five in my opinion the last one is the easiest to follow stay away from intoxicants so all i have to do is stay away from things like alcohol okay so this fortified my belief that i am on the right track because the spiritual guidelines also take us in this direction okay okay this is a nice one i came across this guideline which many of us might have heard treat your body like a temple it's beautiful okay so not only the body also the mind right i treat both like a temple so when you go to a temple we don't desecrate it like we treat it with a lot of respect and we keep it clean and we keep it nice and beautiful and that's how we should keep our body like instead of pouring alcohol which is i will just tell you it's a iarc group one carcinogen <laughs> okay <laughs> it's not a health food i have come to understand why would i put alcohol in my body also it it's an intoxicant it affects the mind okay so we really should follow these guidelines it's a very elegant guideline beautiful guideline treat your body like a temple okay <laughs> okay one more thing that inspires me is this ashtanga yoga okay Uh, so this is a spiritual uh, uh, teachings from india it's a eight step journey starting with the foundations of yama and niyam okay we call them yam niyam or we can call them yama niyama this is the foundation on which the rest of the steps are built culminating in in the pinnacle okay but yama is the first one yama as i understand has to do with you know we draw boundaries around ourselves and we just don't cross those boundaries and they all they, they have to do with things like don't touch alcohol okay so we really have to follow these boundaries and and not indulge in certain negative behaviors like drinking alcohol okay and intoxicant that uh, affects our mind and body both something i want to emphasize is many of my friends uh, say moderation is okay right they indulge in something that they know is not uh, health promoting or something negative once in a while okay so that is called moderation okay moderation in my experience when it comes to things like alcohol okay uh, is okay when everything is going happy in life okay we have ups and downs in life the so called vicissitudes of life so when our life becomes difficult when we have an emotionally uh, difficult period of our life some trauma has happened some death some uh, separation has happened some loss has happened and all of us just experience them right so when something like that happens that period could last several months sometimes several years we got we got traumatized it is in those times that our boundaries get tested especially for things like alcohol and as i showed you right i want to really emphasize this point look at my story that i'm sharing with you it started in a very benign way I, i'm not a drunk or something but this step happened number 5 luckily i did not go very deep but this has showed me in my personal life the value of this foundation in ashtanga yoga yama okay for things like alcohol we need strict boundaries okay <laughs> we we can't play games a little bit here a little bit there in difficult times this boundary gets tested it's for that reason i encourage my friends to study this concept of moderation and strict boundaries <laughs> okay okay let's move to some technical information how many of us drink i was surprised just too many of us who guidelines Uh, WHO report says 2.3 billion people are current drinkers defined as uh, somebody who's age 15 or older who's consumed an alcoholic beverage in the last 12 month period okay that's just too many i was not expecting this large a number how much are they drinking on average again very surprising it's like three drinks per day <laughs> i can't believe this okay and some people are heavy episodic drinkers which is uh, one fifth of uh, these people and one fourth uh, uh, half of the of the males listed here okay even that number is too surprising for me just too large okay in india luckily the incidence is lower okay men all india around 18.7 women 
I'm so delighted. It's just 1.3. I wish it were even lower, but it's a very small percentage. And this is based on Government of India Surveys, NFHS 5 survey. Okay. WHO guidelines uh, remind us, uh, why is it a bad idea to drink alcohol? Well, they say 3 million deaths worldwide can be attributed to alcohol. What kind of deaths? Digestive diseases. Okay, sitting here. Unintentional injuries, cardiovascular diseases, Cardiovascular diseases. Don't you hear that uh, alcohol might be good for our heart? <laughs> Look, cardiovascular diseases are listed here by WHO uh, associated with alcohol. So many deaths, okay? Then there are these cancers, then suicides and alcohol use disorders. So that is kind of the spectrum of all these health problems, okay? We can also look at it in a different way from the perspective of individual health conditions. Like what fraction of that condition is due to alcohol? <laughs> so 100% of alcohol use disorders are naturally because of alcohol, right? And one fifth of the suicides are being associated with alcohol, like 18%. How about interpersonal violence, traffic injuries? You know, this is stuff that we cause to others potentially, not just us. If you have an accident or doing interpersonal violence, then who's getting injured? Well, me and others both, right? So look at the percentage. A fifth of interpersonal violence and almost uh, a quarter of traffic injuries are associated with alcohol. And then come a bunch of these health problems like liver cirrhosis, mouth cancer, tuberculosis, and colorectal cancer. Okay, let's look at these cancers, okay? Let's see, what do cancer organizations say? American Cancer Society says it is best not to drink alcohol. Straightforward guideline, very clear. But many of us are drinking, many of us choose to drink, so they have an additional guideline for those who choose to drink. They say, if you do choose to drink alcohol, women should have no more than one drink per day and men should have no more than two drinks per day. Okay, uh, I want to emphasize one point. Many of us might have read just this part of the guideline and thought, yeah, I do choose to drink alcohol and I'm doing moderation. But we really must read both guidelines together, okay? It's a composite guideline. There are two, two aspects to it, okay? It is best not to drink alcohol is the primary guideline and if somebody chooses to drink alcohol, then they should really minimize. That's kind of the nature of these guidelines, okay? Okay, AICR, American Institute for Cancer Research, another prestigious organization, they, uh, they have a lot of cancer specialists. They say it is best not to drink alcohol, okay? Now, here is some blurb in World Heart Federation report, okay? Uh, it's called Impact of Alcohol Consumption on Cardiovascular Health, Myths and Measures 2022. Now, this is a heart uh, federation, so they focus on the heart, but this particular report touches upon many, many uh, aspects of alcohol. It's a very uh, strongly worded report. What do they say about cancer? It's been attributed in the cancers of the oral cavity, pharynx, larynx, esophagus, liver, stomach, colon, rectum. Okay, so what are all these places in our body? They happen to be in the GI tract. Oral cavity, like we pour alcohol into your mouth, right here, right? And then there's a pharynx, which is uh, part of our the same system, then larynx is, is the voice box, then esophagus, you know, there's a pipe through which the fluids and the food that we're eating goes down, okay? It goes to the stomach, stomach has uh, the additional organs here, liver, and then it goes down to the colon, then the rectum. You know, all these organs listed here is basically the GI tract. So again, one of my motivations is, these organizations, famous ones are saying that uh, this is actually causal in nature. I'll come to that in a moment. Alcohol goes down here, down the throat, stomach, rectum. Why would I want to irritate or increase my chances of cancer in my GI tract? Okay, that motivates me. I really don't want to <laughs> irritate my GI tract in any way. I really want good digestion because it's critical for my survival. Okay, breast cancer. Even a small amount of alcohol has been linked with an increase in the risk of breast cancer. Okay, so let's look at this little nuance. Does alcohol really cause cancer? So causality is being discussed. So there's an organization called IARC. It falls under WHO, International Agency for Research on Cancer. So what is their mission? The organization exists to classify potential carcinogens into different categories. Okay, they are called groups. Group one is the highest group. So a potential carcinogen makes its way into group one when two things have been checkmarked. The two qualifying criteria are sufficient evidence in humans and causal relationship has been established. I mean, these are the two main things going on. Okay, so causality is very tricky in scientific circles. So I once read a book by Casti. Uh, he's a mathematician. He has a nice book. Uh, I forgot the name of the book. Uh, one of the chapters was on causality and correlation as debated for the last 2000 years. 
that convinced me that it's a very complex subject uh, it, it's difficult to distinguish between the two if you if you go to it uh, very deep uh, okay so but in the modern world scientists and groups of scientists have set you know rules of thumb and agreed upon methodologies to establish causality i just want to illustrate one point today we know that smoking causes cancer we we know it right but it took scientists a lot of research to really establish it that smoking causes cancer <laughs> here's an example ron fisher okay ronald fisher he's known as the father of modern statistics okay he's a very key person in statistics history in 1950s uh, he refused to believe that we have established that smoking causes cancer okay there's a classic paper by him in which he steps up and says i know a lot of people are saying that we have established smoking causes cancer he says he does not believe that we have really established it there are lots of technical reasons there there are confounding factors and there are the questions like do have we really looked at all possible factors there might be some uh, you know i don't know what it's called the uh, the exogenous factor something unknown so there are lots of technical issues there are big books written on causality the only point i'm making is for something to be placed in group 1 as an irc group 1 carcinogen a lot of evidence has to be in place so that we really have established causality now three things are of interest to me smoking alcoholic beverages and processed meat okay so for all of them we have established causality as per irc group 1 uh, like uh, classification so alcohol smoking processed meat all three so many of my friends don't know about processed meat 2015 processed meat uh, was placed in irc group 1 okay and just to go back to alcohol a little bit here is a publication world cancer report alcohol consumption etiology they have this table causal 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 which cancers uh, oral cavity pharynx larynx esophagus colorectum liver you know that gi tract that i told you plus breast cancer right okay looking at all this data and i'll show you some more data about alcohol not just cancer but even more data uh should we really treat alcohol and smoking similarly uh in what way okay in my life i grew up in india in india when we had to go watch uh, movies in a theater or uh, we used to call it cinema hall right before the movie started we were shown ads specifically for smoking and cancer to convince us or to to impress upon us that smoking causes cancer specifically lung cancer right so that was very strong messaging now the question is should we have similar commensurate messaging for alcohol also like should we be shown such ads before the movie starts for example now for smoking there is the second hand smoke issue right if i'm smoking then other people are also getting affected so that's why there is a more social awareness you know you are free to smoke but i don't want to smoke so that's why we we are not allowed to smoke in other planes for example uh, in many parts of usa Uh, we can't smoke outside buildings we, we can't smoke in restaurants in public places smoking is kind of discouraged okay there's a lot of public awareness should we have commensurate similar guidelines and social awareness for alcohol also that is the question i'm posing uh, if you compare the degree of evidence both of them are iarc group 1 carcinogens okay plus uh, i'll show you other aspects of alcohol in a moment okay is alcohol good for the heart uh, let's see American Heart Association they have a 2021 dietary guidelines we can find them online there are free pdf files and html pages guideline number 9 is about alcohol if you do not drink alcohol do not start very clearly american heart association says that you know but many of us choose to drink so then they say if you choose to drink alcohol then limit the intake and then they will have more details okay World Heart Federation uh, I, I just mentioned <laughs> World Heart Federation this report I personally found it very strongly worded uh, let's go through it uh, step by step okay people living with cardiovascular disease and other chronic illnesses what should they do their recommendation is abstinence zero none at all okay pregnant women and breastfeeding women abstinence zero none at all children young people abstinence zero none at all now let's look at these adults with no underlying health conditions okay So adults with no underlying health condition can be in two categories abstainers and drinkers. So abstainers are people who used to drink but they have stopped or somebody who never drank they abstain. The recommendation is not advised to start drinking. Okay? Those who are drinking World Heart Federation says there are no safe recommended levels of alcohol consumption. Those who drink are advised to consult with their doctor on how to make healthy choices. Okay? See what they're telling us. Okay. Is alcohol good for our heart? 
World Heart Federation report says, contrary to popular opinion, alcohol is not good for the heart. And then they have explanation in great detail why they say this. Okay, is alcohol good for us in general? Okay, World Heart Federation says, alcohol uh, is linked with approximately two thirty diseases. <laughs> okay, that's a mind-boggling number for me. Two thirty diseases, including forty diseases that would not prevail without cancer. It's a crucial factor in deaths due to many many diseases. Okay. When I look at this number 230 diseases, you know what goes in my mind? I'm imagining how many papers got written to establish this linkage. Okay, just for one disease, at the very least, we need some observational studies that cancer happened and, you know, there was some connection with something that we consumed like alcohol and such studies are replicated uh, often in different contexts, in different uh, demographics, different groups, different countries. How many papers have been written so that World Heart Federation can issue this statement that it's connected to 230 diseases? Lots, <laughs> okay. A lot of papers have been written, okay. And 40 diseases would not prevail without alcohol, okay. All of this, what I'm telling you, requires a lot of research, okay. All I'm saying is there is a preponderance of evidence pointing in this direction, okay. It's not just one or two doctors saying something, not just one or two studies. Thousands of studies put together will lead to these kind of statements, okay. Alcohol and women's health, very important. Even a small amount of alcohol has been linked with an, with an increase in the risk of breast cancer. Okay, and now let's read this passage. I personally feel this is a very important passage. We should read it. Women are less likely to consume alcohol than men. I am so delighted to hear that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. However, the use of alcohol may have more implications for women than men with respect to physical illnesses and more severe cognitive and motor impairment with a much lower alcohol exposure as compared to men. Do you see what's going on? So women are likely to get impacted disproportionately much higher with less alcohol in many ways, you know, physical health, cognitive impairment, motor impairment, like it's like a whole body phenomenon going on, right? <laughs> see what's going on? It's for this reason, women should be much more cautious. And there are cultures where many people are drinking in general, uh, men drink more than women. And I would really encourage men to study what happens to women. Uh, the implications are much severer for women and many men may not know this. And men might be encouraging women to join and drink. I really feel uh, we should all study this, okay? Women should read this, men should read this and figure out what is the impact to women. And I wish I had done a little more research into the impact on the fetus and then child uh, during infancy and even even going back during just conception and uh, pregnancy and delivery and breastfeeding, what happens to the child if women are drinking? Uh, I, I wish I had done that research, I haven't done that yet, but I'm just going by what I found in World Heart Federation uh, report. Okay, this report goes on and on. <sighs> Many more conditions, liver cirrhosis, psychiatric disorders, infection disease and so on and so on. Okay, you can read it if you want to. Social impact of alcohol, significant societal impact, motor, motor vehicle accidents, injuries, familial discord, burden on the country's criminal justice system. Okay, okay. Alcohol has all these impacts. Okay. So I grew up knowing all this. Okay. So my parents raised me and I knew all this is related to alcohol. It's, it's there in, uh, in, in movies. They show it in uh, like these, uh, what are they called? TV shows. It's kind of common knowledge, all this stuff. Okay. <laughs> But sometimes we have to write formal reports and measure it and write in serious papers also, right? Okay, this is nice. Who drinks alcohol, rich or poor? So, you know, high social demographic index countries, the prevalence is very high, 72% females, 83% males. High social demographic index countries uh, tend to be rich countries where the GDP is higher, the income level is higher, uh, you know, more resources are spent and... Look at this, in low and middle income countries, only 8.9% females and 20% of males were alcohol consumers. Okay, there's a big contrast. Now, my personal life is similar. I grew up in a middle class family. My parents are professors and teachers. Uh, and I had no alcohol at home. And I grew up in an environment knowing we should not drink alcohol. I came to USA for higher education, pursuing a PhD in Stanford. Before that, I was doing a master's in UC Berkeley, computer science. And just without thinking, impromptu, four or five of us said, okay, let's drink alcohol. And you can kind of see how it happens because alcohol is so common in USA. It's considered part of life. It's just okay. Many of my friends I know from IITs, they adopted drinking. So this was what happened to me. Okay. But I came back thanks to my parents' way of living. 
Okay, World Heart Federation also says uh, strong uh, words about alcohol advertising. You can read this if you feel like. Let's go to USDA guidelines, okay? USDA is US Department of Agriculture. So every five years they come up with guidelines. There is a scientific report uh, that's, that gets uh, written by a group of scientists and then another uh, committee finalizes the report. So this is the scientific report of 2020 Dietary Guidelines Advice the Committee. Those who do not drink should not begin to drink under the belief, under the mistaken belief that alcohol would make them healthier. Okay, this is what the scientific report says. And then they're saying, what is the concern with alcohol, right? So people who drink higher amounts of alcohol, you know, they have a higher mortality risk as compared to people who are drinking less. So mortality risk has to do with uh, shortening of our life. Okay, uh, our, our, our lifespan is reducing. That's what they are uh, mentioning here. Let's look at Canada, Canada's food guide. Again, strong words. There are health risks linked to drinking alcohol. If you do not drink alcohol, you are not encouraged to start. But many of us are drinking, right? So what to do if we already are? They say, if you drink alcohol, go to these uh, uh, guidelines here. And these guidelines are by Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse and Addiction. And they updated their guidelines, 2023. This is the latest guidelines. They say, even a small amount of alcohol can be damaging to health. Later, they say, no amount or kind of alcohol is good for your health. Later they say, even a small amount is damaging to everyone, okay? Now, look at this. It doesn't matter what kind of alcohol it is, wine, beer, cider, or spirits. And then they say, regardless of age, sex, gender, ethnicity, tolerance for alcohol, or lifestyle. You know, it's kind of a comprehensive statement. And, you know, sentence after sentence is kind of uh, re-emphasizing this point. Uh, it's driving home this point. We really should not drink any alcohol. Even tiny amounts, small amounts, are affecting us negatively, right? That is a message by uh, Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse and Addiction, which is what Canada's food guide points to, okay? Okay, let's move forward. Is zero alcohol really important to minimize health risk? So here is a paper, 2018, Lancet, which is a uh, famous medical journal. Five twelve researchers, I believe they were from a lot of countries, uh, uh, and 23 health problems were studied, okay? Such a large team, they wrote this paper and they say, Level of consumption that minimizes health loss is zero. Okay, and of concern, the main uh, like two important concerns are all cause mortality and cancers. All cause mortality has to do with shortening of our life. Okay, uh, we live shorter lives. Now, why do so many people have to come together? Five, twelve researchers. I was thinking just to do this research, such a large team was assembled. They have to coordinate. They have to send emails here and there. <laughs> and then write these papers. A lot of data was looked at. 23 health problems are being studied. Why do we have to do all this? Don't we know enough from thousands of studies already in the in the last several decades? The answer is yes, we already know quite a bit. But this kind of work has to be done to really, you know, convince people across the world that alcohol is not healthy for our health. Because a lot of people are not aware of it. So we need more awareness, okay? That's why this kind of paper gets written, <laughs> okay? Okay, I found this couple of articles are nice. Uh, there's a Mother Jones article um, uh, uh, in 2018. I found it uh, to be insightful. Okay, uh, just a recap. I shared with you my personal story, how I got started at Stanford, a five-year phase at Vim without thinking much. And then I came back because my parents uh, had a zero uh, alcohol lifestyle. So when you're having a kid, we should really inspect our own lifestyle because the kid will follow us, right? They get, they see what we are doing. And even though children may do other things uh, as they grow older in their teen years or 20s, even 30s, but at some point of time, you know, the way we were raised plays a role in our mind. And some of these good habits attract us. And I just stepped back. I said, I'm just stopping. That's what I did. That's all. <laughs> I, I didn't have to go through any de-addiction program or craving, nothing. I just stepped back. I said, I'll do what my parents were doing. So it's helpful to raise our kids with, uh, you know, uh, uh, top-notch guidelines. And I'm inspired by these uh, spiritual guidelines, like uh, just don't have intoxicants, okay? We should treat our body like a temple. And I, I really like this yama niyam concept. Yama has to do with don't touch some things, okay? Good boundaries. Because it's when emotionally difficult times emerge in our life, due to death, due to some disease, due to losses, due to some trauma, that's when our boundaries for things like alcohol get tested. Okay, so that's why we should have good boundaries, even when we are very happy and very joyful and everything is going perfectly in our life. Even then, we should follow good boundaries and not moderation in things like alcohol. Okay, so plus I shared with you all these guidelines from multiple uh, health organizations, which also inspire me. 
So I'm writing articles at Thankful to Plants. Uh, if you like these uh, videos, please like, uh, subscribe and share. Uh, thank you so much.